And welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where each season we select six movies that are all related to a single theme. And then on each episode, we take a look at the people in front of and behind the camera to try to make some sense out of how this movie runs and why it was even made. And on top of all that, we pop the hood and get all up in the movie's engine to examine it piece by piece to see if it's any good. And this is season 10, where our theme is Hot Wheels, and we are featuring six movies all based on automobiles and automobile adjacent topics. And boy, are you in luck because this is the end of the road. We're talking about episode six with a barely remembered 1990s era classic, The Chase, starring Charlie Sheen and Christy Swanson. You don't remember this movie? You never saw this movie? Well, guess what? That makes two of us. You know what? I forgot to introduce myself. How rude. I'm Chad Cooper, one of the two hosts of this podcast, and the gas to my brakes, Mr. Bo Ransdell, who will be in here momentarily to set up this episode because this is one of the movies he picked for this season. I would have never chosen something this terrible, and that's why I love Bo as my podcaster in crime. He digs up movies that are so terrible, so unwatchable, so unbearably awful that it makes my job of goofing on them with jokes all that much easier. So you know what? Let's get Bo in here to get this episode up to ramming speed as he introduces us to the nonstop action, thrill a minute, seat up your pants, fever dream nightmare that is 1994's classic, The Chase. Everybody in the booth, real quick, I need your help in discouraging Bo from selecting movies for the next season. You tried to stop I, him from I know you the tried. Chase, to, man, but he was on I know. One of his can business. we all agree that we will try to discourage him from submitting films to review? I'll give it a shot. Just we'll keep that our secret. Okay. okay you got sh- it, boy. Here comes Bo. Shh. Hey, Bo. It, uh, it's time for you to record your intro. It's human nature. This delight in the chase. And not just human nature as it happens. Across the animal kingdom, we see a similar urge to play chase with one another. Squirrels, monkeys, even kittens, they all play this same game. For humans, which I'm, the most popular chase game I can recall is Tag, where one person is it, and they have to chase a bunch of friends and or schoolyard tormentors to clap them on the back and declare, no, you are the one who is it. But it doesn't stop there. There's the ever popular I'm gonna get you game we play with toddlers, naturally playing the monster who chases them while they giggle in terror and delight and flee from us. What about the role of the quarterback in football? After the snap, the whole point is everyone is chasing that player in one grand game of I'm gonna get you. It's all part and parcel of the natural instinct to chase and to be chased. But what the hell, science? How come we do that thing? Well, it's downright evolutionary. Way back in the old days, before we had Twitter and reality shows, we were a bunch of half-evolved mouth breathers with one thing on our minds, staying alive long enough to fucking make more of us. And we did well, so yay humans. We were also prey for all kinds of predators and had to evolve our big old brains to keep us safe. But while the brains were cooking, we had old-fashioned biological instinct to keep us safe, and that meant learning how to evade predators. When the saber-toothed tiger crept up on us, we had to have the skills to get away, lest we become saber-toothed dung in the not-so-distant future. And so, biologists believe, we invented the play of chasing and being chased. And not just us. As I mentioned, all kinds of animals exhibit the same behavior with some subtle differences. Squirrels, lambs, us. From a psychological perspective, We in that illustrious group of mammals tend to prefer being the ones chased, the chasey, if you will. But other animals, predators like lions and tigers and bears, oh my, well they play chase too, but they prefer being the one in pursuit, the chaser. We're all honing our survival skills. For the predators, how best to give chase, and for us, how best to get away. And in that play as children, we learn to survive as adults. But it doesn't always go that way. Almost no one who has ever been truly and properly chased gets away with it. You can make an argument for D.B. Cooper, the thief who parachuted out of a plane never to be seen again, but evidence suggests he probably died in that jump. The money scattered to the winds. But he's an exception. The rule is, 
you flee, you will be caught. Not to say there aren't some fun examples of this you might use in the introduction to a podcast, so let's get to it. I have to admit, aside from robbing a bank as part of a heist crew, being the object of a high-speed police pursuit sounds like a whole lot of fun to me. Or it did, until I started researching it. Take, for example, a personal favorite. As a fan of the James Garner classic film Tank, how great is it to hear that a plumber stole a tank and led police on a long pursuit? Sounds awesome, right? Well, around 6.30 at night on May 17, 1995, Sean Nelson slipped undetected into the California Army National Guard Armory and probably used a crowbar to open up one of the hatches. Tanks, I have learned, are push-button starters, so keep that tidbit in your back pocket when the end times come. The good news in this tank theft is that the ammunition was kept in a different building, so Sean Nelson had no way to fire the tank's impressive weaponry, so he instead led police on a very televised 23-minute pursuit by San Diego police. The tank's top speed was only 30 miles an hour, which is slow, but it is, you know, a tank. So by nature, tough to pull over using hand waves and lights and that kind of thing. So Nelson plowed through fire hydrants, ran over cars, and generally caused chaos. He got the tank stuck on a concrete barrier, and then he was trapped. What a fun adventure. Up until the police used bolt cutters to open one of the tank's hatches and had to shoot Nelson when he refused to leave the tank. Also, It turned out he was probably psychotic, thanks to a serious meth addiction that once led him to dig a 15-foot deep hole in his yard in a search for gold. Well, that turned out kind of tragic. Let's try this one. Dateline Southern California, 10 a.m. on September 12, 2012. Bank robbers jump in an SUV and flee the scene, pursued by dozens of officers. In an attempt to either garner goodwill from potential jurors, slow down the cops pursuing them, or just to do it, the passengers of the SUV begin hurling money that they've just stolen out of the windows of the car. They were pursued from Santa Clarita to South Los Angeles, where the SUV was trapped between police and another car, and the rubbers were arrested. Not exactly a happy ending, but better than being shot in a tank. Or how about this one? A real just-for-the-hell-of-it affair, which took place in Los Angeles in 2016. Two knuckleheads rob a house and steal a fancy convertible Mustang. The police are called and the chase is on, but these idiots in the Mustang are in it for the thrills and start to race through Hollywood and LA at high speeds on an infrequent day of rain when the streets are slick. What makes this so much fun, recklessly speaking, is the whole time the driver is evading cops and weaving in and out of traffic, the passenger is standing up and dancing in the passenger seat, giving thumbs up signs and flipping off the cops. The driver, not to be outdone, does donuts in the Mustang on Sunset Effin Boulevard. They high-five drivers in the cars they pass, and the whole thing keeps going until the car, now on only three wheels, is found in South Los Angeles with the driver sitting on the hood, waiting for the cops to arrive. Both men surrendered without injury, and no one got hurt. Whew, that's more like it. I mean, they still had to go to jail, but it's kind of fun. The point is, there is something innate in us that loves a chase. So when you're making a movie, what's more exciting than a car chase done right? And, stay with me, what if the whole movie is just one big car chase? That's the cinematic question pondered by tonight's film, The Chase. The Chase was written and directed by Adam Rifkin, a guy mostly known for indie and schlocky films. Movies like The Dark Backward, in which a mysterious third arm grows out of Judd Nelson's back, or The Invisible Maniac, a movie he directed using a pseudonym, Riff Coogan. The latter is a sci-fi boob comedy of the Cinemax variety, which has largely fallen out of fashion thanks to internet porn. It was with his freshman movie, A Tale of Two Sisters, that he first worked with Charlie Sheen, who was credited as also having written the poems used in that movie. Poet, actor, is there anything Charlie Sheen can't do? I suppose that may sound sarcastic, but before we get into the chase, I guess we should talk about its star, the guy who's in almost every frame of this movie, the one who became a great big joke for his erratic behavior at what would seem to be the height of his power. I am talking about, of course, Christy Swanson. Just teasing, just kidding. Let's talk about Charlie Sheen. He was born Carlos Estevez, son of Ramon Estevez, who you may know better as Martin Sheen. He was the third of four kids, behind brothers Emilio and Ramon, and older than sister Renee. His father moved the family to Malibu, California when Charlie was very young. He was good at sports, and he played pitcher and shortstop for his high school team. 
When he was only nine, Charlie appeared in his first movie, The Execution of Private Slovic. That movie starred his father, and Charlie kind of liked the gig. He ended up making short films with his buddies, who happened to be Rob Lowe and Sean Penn. And what could only be considered foreshadowing, Charlie Sheen never graduated high school, having been expelled only a couple of weeks before not showing up and not being a great student when he did. But he knew what he wanted to do. So he donned the name Charlie Sheen, and he became an actor. When he was only 19, Charlie Sheen nabbed the role of Lance in Grizzly 2 Revenge, a movie that is still unreleased. But a year after that, he played one of the doomed brothers in Red Dawn alongside Patrick Swayze and Leah Thompson and a bunch of people who made 80s teen cinema what it was. That movie was a giant hit, fueled by its charismatic cast and the red panic of the era. And the tale of a communist invasion of America was a bona fide hit. He bounced around some TV movies before landing in The Boys Next Door, a really interesting story of violence directed by Penelope Spheris, who you might recall as the director of the original Wayne's World, and The Decline of Western Civilization, an essential music documentary. He was in Lucas, he cameoed in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, he showed up on Amazing Stories, that uh, Steven Spielberg anthology show. He was ubiquitous. Charlie Sheen was a handsome, likable young actor, and he was all over the place. In 1986, only three years after shooting Grizzly 2 Revenge, not THE Revenge, just Revenge, just three years after that, Sheen was playing the enviable role of Chris in Platoon, a story of a young soldier caught between two men and their ideologies. It was THE movie of 1986, and won about a million Oscars. A year later, Sheen reunited with Platoon's director, Oliver Stone, for Wall Street, a near-perfect encapsulation of America's love affair with capitalism in the 80s. Charlie Sheen wasn't only pretty, he was good. The next year brought us young guns and a host of familiar faces as Sheen and his brother Emilio Estevez joined Lou Diamond Phillips, star of the hit Richie Valens movie La Bamba, Kiefer Don't Call Me Donald Sutherland, and also Rand's Dermot Mulroney and Casey Samasco for Young Guns, a ridiculous movie that starred some of the hottest talent in Hollywood. He showed some good comic chops in Major League after that, which opened the door to other comic opportunities, like the very funny Hot Shots movies. He worked with his brother Emilio in 1990 again on the bizarre Garbage Man comedy Men at Work, one we will almost certainly get to at some point on this show, and he had a hit with the Disney-produced version of The Three Musketeers, and that's where things started changing for Charlie. I mean, they were getting rocky by the time he was donning the fancy chapeau as a musketeer, in 1990, he was engaged to actress Kelly Preston when he accidentally shot her in the arm while monkeying around with a gun. Needless to say, the relationship did not last long after that little incident. You shoot your fiancé, it tends to reveal some underlying issues. After the breakup, Sheen was tied to a number of adult film actresses, including Ginger Lynn, who was in the Wing Commander video games, which they made a bad movie about we covered right here on this show. Brand synergy, people. So while Sheen is dating adult film stars and allegedly indulging in the cocaine on a pretty heroic level, his movie career was losing momentum. A string of forgettable to bad movies like The Arrival, Frame by Frame, Shadow Conspiracy, Bad Day on the Block, there are a lot. Smaller budgets, smaller audiences, and Sheen, privately, is going into a tailspin. In 1998, Charlie Sheen suffered a stroke after overdosing on cocaine. He was saved and sent to rehab, which he promptly ran away from. See, he liked being chased too. The police caught him and threw him back into rehab, as all police do when confronted with a drug user who runs from him. No bullets, just the help he needs. It couldn't be because he's rich, could it? Anyway, that was May, and he was back in rehab in August that year after violating parole for, you guessed it, drugs. A couple years later, in 2000, Sheen met actress Denise Richards, a Bond girl in the just terrible The World Is Not Enough, they did their meet-cute on the set of Good Advice, and the two were married in 2002. That lasted until 2005, when Richards filed for divorce for threats of violence and, you guessed it, drugs and alcohol. In 2008, Sheen married actress Brooke Mueller, and she filed for divorce in 2010, after Charlie was arrested for assault against Miss Mueller. He was sentenced to rehab for, you guessed it, drugs and alcohol, and anger management. The justice system is working. In her attempt to get a restraining order against Charlie Sheen, Mueller wrote, quote, I'm very concerned he is currently insane. While his personal life was devolving, Sheen's career got a bit of a boost when he traded the big screen for the small one. 
In the year 2000, about the time he was wooing Denise Richards, Sheen got a gig replacing Michael J. Fox on the show Spin City. He did well, and when the show ended in 2002, he fell into another sitcom role in 2003. This one was a little show called Two and a Half Men. You might have heard of it. It made a billion dollars. In his last season with the show, Charlie Sheen was making almost $2 million an episode. In 2011, around the time his marriage with Mueller was collapsing, Two and a Half Men went on hiatus. Sheen's drug problem caused the show to abandon the final four episodes of the season while he underwent drug rehabilitation in his home. This would be the third such program in a year. In response to the hiatus, Sheen lashed out publicly at the series creator Chuck Lorre, while his co-star John Cryer remained as neutral as he could in his biography, he said that Charlie looked bad in his last episodes. The one thing Sheen could be counted on, he said, even during his binges, was to show up, hit his marks, and deliver a joke. When that started failing, and his physical appearance grew lean and sickly, a meeting was called. Charlie Sheen blew the meeting off and gave away Chuck Lorre's personal phone number on air during a radio interview. This, predictably, led to all kinds of death threats for Chuck Lorre, and that was really the last straw. Charlie Sheen was fired from the show and banned from the Warner Brothers lot. This was the period we tend to think of now when we think of Charlie Sheen, riling up his followers on Twitter by railing against his former bosses, talking up the adult actresses he was shacking up with as his goddesses, and launching a failed tour called the Violent Torpedo of Truth Tour. It was a very public meltdown due to drugs and fame perhaps the biggest drug of all. As John Cryer put it, quote, Charlie was never an insurrectionary guerrilla fighting the established order. He was a guy who got everything he had ever wanted from it. He even texted somebody at the show once. I think they gave the wrong guy too much money. In 2015, he came out as being HIV positive, but also admitted that he had been aware of this diagnosis for four years. In that time, he claimed over 200 sexual partners but as short as all, he warned them up front. His last fiance had to call the cops on him too, and he's been labeled everything from a 9-11 truther to an anti-vaxxer. While I can't say what it was that seemed to be chasing Sheen all his life, or maybe it was his pursuit of some good life, it caught him, or he caught it, whatever works in your metaphor of choice. But when I look at the life of Charlie Sheen, all his croaks of winning and having dragon blood or whatever, it just makes me sad. He was a talented and fun actor who had the world by the Dragon Balls, and in the end, he could never be high enough, apparently. And what's left isn't Charlie Sheen, not anymore. Years of substance abuse do the most insidious damage of all. They hollow someone out from within. But in 1994, he was still at that high watermark. The world was his burrito, and he was starring in an action movie written and directed by an old friend and starring Buffy the Vampire Slayer herself, Christy Swanson. Yeah, I know, the movie, not the show. And this movie, The Chase, it's strangely ahead of its time. It came out before the OJ chase, and it reflects a media gone wild with an eerie prescience. Even as it throws Henry Rollins, Anthony Kiedis, Flea, and Josh Mustel at you too. It's really quite something. So enough ballyhoo, let's get to it. Chad, get in here and let's get behind the wheel for our season 10 finale. Ladies and gentlemen, chasers and chasees, it is 1994's The Chase. And welcome back, everyone, to Pick 6 Movies. I, of course, uh, Embo Ransdell. With me, as ever, the Christy Swanson to my Charlie Sheen. Uh, it's Chad Cooper. How are you, sir? Let me take my panties off. Right. Um, yeah, I have a lot of questions <laughs> about that scene. As you might have heard in the introduction or in the show title, uh, or just on the streets, this episode is about 1994's The Chase, a Charlie Sheen vehicle, if you will, mm -hmm. in which he is a, a lovable asshole, question mark, who is... Yeah. <laughs> It was <laughs> who is escaping jail. He's on the run. He kidnaps Christy Swanson. And the movie's premise essentially is what if the whole movie was one big car chase? Right. Are we done? Uh, yes, we're finished. Um, <laughs> that was the chase. What's on the next episode of Pick <laughs> Six Movies, Bo? Up next, season 11, Chad. I am always a little bit freaked out when someone says they've never seen this movie. 
I'd never seen this movie until you suggested it over and over and over again. And I got to tell you, Bo, when you said you wanted to do The Chase, I went and watched the 1966 film featuring Marlon Brando as a Texas sheriff who chases after a uh, prison escapee, Robert Redford, mm-hmm. um, who's, you know, looking to come and get this guy who's sleeping with his wife, who's played by Jane Fonda. Mm-hmm. And it's directed by uh, Arthur Penn, you know, who had done The Miracle Worker, mm-hmm. and he went on to do Bonnie and Clyde and Little Big Man. And I was Brilliant like, man, director, yeah. this, this, this is a real movie. Mm-hmm. What do we do? This is a real, real movie. Not like the shit we talk about. Yeah. But instead, I was wrong. Then you came to my house and I was like, Chad, it's time to watch The Chase. And you were like, I love Brando. And I, yes. I ignored that comment because I thought you were drunk. Scratch that. I ignored that comment because I knew you were drunk. Right. And I thought that was just crazy drunk talk. Yeah. Well, I was doing my Brando and I was drunk. <laughs> yeah. So. I have seen this movie. You're going to want to. It's going to be great. Yeah. See, that sounds like a manatee. <laughs> well, it's, Bram, it's my Brando. Right. Who is part manatee uh, in the island of Dr. Manatee? <laughs> Instead, we watched this movie from 1994 written and directed by Adam Rifkin. Yes. And it is a very different movie than the Brando slash Redford slash Fonda film. Adam Rifkin... Again, as you said, he wrote and directed this movie. He also directed Detroit Rock City. Uh And most recently, he made that Burt Reynolds movie, The Last Movie Star. I didn't watch it because it looked like a real downer. He also co-produced that Adam Sandler movie, Going Overboard, where (laughs) Adam Sandler plays a young comedian who takes a job on a cruise ship so he can make it in the world of cruise ship comedy. And that's that movie is a real downer. Is that the one that had him hanging from the pubic hair that was just garden hose? Do you know the movie I'm talking about? No, this is the one where when Sandler hit it big, they suddenly put this movie on VHS and DVD, and he's sort of standing akimbo with his hands in the air like he's an Egyptian, like, huh? You know, and you're like, that's an Adam Sandler movie, and then you watched it, and you're like, this is a piece of shit. Right, it's just a boob comedy, right? Kind of, but, okay. you know, he was just trying to make his way in the world. He wasn't producing the quality work that we know from Adam Sandler today. <laughs> he wasn't really Shabadoo in it up in that movie. <laughs> it was more like Shabadoo. Yeah, it was very subdued. Oh. The chase, though, is what we're talking about eventually. And like I said, it freaks me out when, when people tell me that they've never seen it because I had seen it a bunch as a kid. And I don't, I think maybe the first time I watched it was because like I liked Rollins and I was like, oh, okay, well, let's give this a shot. And it's on HBO Mm -hmm. and I'm a fat kid hiding from the sun. People love this movie. I'd never heard of it, but I went to read some of the IMDb reviews, you know, from the regular folk, you know, people of the land. (laughs) Yeah. Morons. Yeah. Yeah. And all of the reviews are like, hey man, I fucking love this thing. It's fucking awesome. It's got cars. It's got chili peppers. They fuck at 100 miles an hour. What's not to love about this movie? Fuck you. I don't know what to tell you. I wrote that under a a throwaway (laughs) account, but (laughs) the fuck you is what gave it away. That's how I end all my reviews. (laughs) I thought Get Out was a timely commentary on race relations, so fuck you. (laughs) English patient was overrated. Fuck you. I thought 1917's gimmick was impressive on a technical level, but it lacked the heart to truly capture the imagination, so fuck you. I'm a deus. You're a dumbass. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Schindler's List. You know what? It actually, it, was, it, it deserved everything that uh, it received. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah, The Chase. So let's just get into it, because clearly uh-huh. this introduction is meandering in much the same way as the movie. <laughs> Uh, we start with some good old fashioned punk music and uh-huh. the title flashes by real fast, like almost too fast for us to catch it. Just the chase. And then we're fucking in the movie. Well, That's the it. title card shatters yeah. like glass. And I immediately thought, oh, this is a ripoff of Mortal Kombat. Nope. Because Mortal Kombat came out the following year. I was like, well, maybe it's a ripoff of Lethal Weapon 2, which for my money has the greatest opening of any yes. movie of all time. 100%. This is post Lethal Weapon 2 has to be. Post Lethal Weapon 2, pre Mortal Kombat. All right. And as the movie opens, we see Charlie Sheen driving a silver convertible 1989 Volks 
Volkswagen Rabbit. Or as most people know this automobile, oh my god, did you see what Becky's parents got her as a graduation present? It means they don't love her. It's the least threatening of all cars, though. Like, if somebody were barreling down on you in a Volkswagen Rabbit convertible, you'd be like, that is adorable. That is going to be the <laughs> cutest hit and run ever. <laughs> if only Matthew Broderick had been in a Volkswagen Rabbit convertible, Chad. That dust-up never would have happened. Charlie Sheen pulls into a gas station, and he saunters inside to get a snack and some cigarettes and $5 worth of gasoline to put in this car. And I want to ask you, when you put gas in your car these days, do you always fill it up? Yeah, of course. Do you remember when you hit that milestone in life where you had enough money to fill up your car every time you put gas in it? Because I clearly remember multiple times where I would go up to the attendant to be like, I'd like $2.24 worth of gasoline sir i remember the exact moment chad the year was 2018 i was, <laughs> I was at a liquor store i remember fishing out change in the couch just being so thrilled when i found a quarter on the ground and being like oh my god this will get me to work until thursday when i get paid those were the days of like the bartending jobs where it's like i just gotta get to work man yeah. once i <laughs> Once I get there, I got money again. Mm -hmm. yeah. You bought a Sam's card so that on Saturdays you could go and enjoy the buffet. <laughs> I did not get to that point. I was <laughs> I was more of the like, oh shit, let me get this 12 pack and a couple <laughs> packs of smokes. Hey, where'd all my money go? <laughs> Fuck, I got to get to work tomorrow. <laughs> Dennis, check the cushions. No, the other ones. We haven't checked those <laughs> since Tuesday. <laughs> you invite people over just because you're hoping that a, a couple of nickels and dimes might shimmy out of their pockets. Just strangers with loose pockets. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, wow. You got cargo shorts. Come with me. I just need you to sit here and wiggle for a while. We play a game called Earthquake at my house. You sit on the couch and I shake it <laughs> until you can't handle it anymore. Oh, man. That was the third time I got arrested. <laughs> Playing Earthquake with strangers for nickels. Charlie Sheen is in this gas and sip and he goes over and he buys a Butterfinger candy bar. I don't like Butterfingers. I'm not sure what flavor a Butterfinger is supposed to be. To me, it tastes like stale yellow styrofoam slathered in pretend chocolate. It's not, not my choice of candy bar. In a pinch, sure. <laughs> Sheen goes up to the counter to pay for his smokes and his candy and his $5 of gas. He takes the candy bar and he sticks it in his back pocket. And Charlie Sheen, it's going to melt there. You don't put a candy bar in your back pocket like that. It's bad candy etiquette. Good candy access right there on the hip. <laughs> this convenience store clerk who's wearing a red shirt and a black bow tie just starts punching buttons on the cash register. And I got to stop right here. Not only do I not like Butterfingers. I don't like bow ties, and I am immediately suspicious of the motives behind anyone who wears a bow tie. Tucker Carlson, Louis Farrakhan, Orville Redenbacher, Pee Wee Herman. Unless these four start a barbershop quartet, I'm going to politely say no thank you to anything that they're offering. Ten years in the future, and this part would have gone to Jack McBrayer. <laughs> but he, we've got ourselves a real dumb dumb of a clerk as you see only in the movies mm -hmm. where he's doing things like trying to open coins he's just like don't don't know what the trouble is and like <laughs> finally busts them open and the coins go everywhere he's like guess i better pick them all up right now be back in a second mister and then just dips below the counter to blow himself or pick up nickels or whatever he's doing back there <laughs> charlie sheen kind of shares a look with christy swanson did you just say he tucked out behind the counter to blow himself? Or other things, Chad. I didn't specifically say that. I said that was one of many things he could be doing behind the counter. I didn't know that was an option. Wow. Okay. Maybe it's just the life I live, but when I saw that in the movie, I was like, oh, he's about to suck his own dick, as you so often see in these films. About this time, Charlie Sheen looks over and he sees Christy Swanson perusing a magazine in this gas and sip quick stop. And Christy Swanson, she looks like she's on her way to the Kentucky Derby. She's got this giant <laughs> hat and this sleeveless dress and these big gold earrings and her makeup is perfect. And I just question who peruses magazines at a convenience store in the mid 1990s. And I realized that mobile phones weren't a thing. So this is how people would occupy themselves and pass the time. But who would do this even then? And I'm thinking people waiting to buy drugs, 
kids looking at mainstream porno rags, maybe a really bad detective on a stakeout. Did she specifically come here for this magazine? Did someone recommend <laughs> the magazine to her? Is this her regular Tuesday thing, which is new magazine day? She refers to it as the library. <laughs> she shoots Charlie Sheen this look like, huh, you look poor and dangerous. I might fuck you later yeah sheen reciprocates by giving her this creepy stare of like i'll bet your skin tastes really good on the inside how old are you don't wait don't tell me <laughs> but yeah so while he's uh shooting her a look some cops pull up and when uh -huh. sheen sees these cops he's like hey, hey wait a second this may not be great for me the rabbit is parked outside we don't know that's stolen yet but uh, Sheen is kind of watching them enter. And as they come inside, there's uh, they grab some shit. Christy Swanson wraps up her magazine perusal. And so it's Sheen at the counter, Christy Swanson behind him, cops behind her. Bo, I really identified with this moment because I was once in a convenience store and I was buying beer with a fake ID. And I was in line and there were a couple people in front of me and two cops came in and grabbed some snacks and they were right behind me. And I was scared shitless that when I got up to the clerk, if they looked at my fake ID, they were immediately going to bust me and these cops would just take me straight to jail. But the clerk, you know, it was a convenience store clerk, didn't give a fuck about anything right. and just sold me the beer. And I walked out, my heart is pounding. I was so thankful. I got in my buddy's car and I swore, you know what? I will never, ever buy beer again with a fake ID. And you know what? I'm never, ever going to drink beer again. And then later that night when we polished off that 12 pack, he drove me back to the convenience store and I bought another 12 pack so that we could finish out the night's festivities. That tracks. That feels like the promise of a 17-year-old. I just want to ask you, were you driving that night? Uh, potentially. <laughs> I was I was probably the one who was like, we should get more beer. I've had half of this, and that's not enough. So our two cops are behind them, and one of them kind of looks like Tom Bergeron, and the other one looks a little like Neil deGrasse Tyson. And our dopey clerk, he keeps like beep bop booping the buttons on this cash register. It's like watching a monkey with a speaking spell. That's a thing that uh, old people know about. Christy Swanson, after she throws down her copy of Vogue and Young Bitch Monthly on the counter that she's going to purchase, and she's got her bright red lipstick and her face is all pruned up, and she's looking around like she's better than everybody. And then the, um, the cops get a call that says like, hey, uh, 20 out of 12, we're looking for a uh, missing, uh, stolen volkswagen silver rabbit that's right behind you officers and they look around and they look at charlie sheen they're like hey man is is that your your car and charlie sheen says me officer no i'm uh i'm on foot i'm just out for a little jog and then the bow tie clerk uh, chimes in hey sir here's the change for that gasoline you just put into that silver 1989 rabbit license plate c37 v49 is there anything else sir <laughs> and the cop goes jog huh and it's like well these these super cops have gotten themselves into a real mess because charlie <laughs> sheen immediately smacks the clerk's open hand sending change flying into the air as i assume a distraction uh-huh charlie sheen then takes the butterfinger from his back pocket jabs it into christy swanson's back and kind of hugs her to him t effectively taking her hostage do you think that her first thought was, he's sticking me with a gun, he's sticking me with his fingers, he's sticking me with his penis? In the pie chart of what this could be in the life of Christy Swanson, it's like 67% penis, <laughs> like 22% gun, 11% other. Oh my god, get that out of my back. <laughs> Charlie, she tells this a uh, bow-tied, untrustworthy, shifty-eyed clerk to take the cop's guns, put them on the ground, and kick them over to Charlie Sheen. And what does this bow-tie clerk do, Bo? He kicks the guns towards Charlie Sheen, but with enough force to send it way past him to the back of the store. Right. He's untrustworthy because of his bow tie. Go with your gut, people. <laughs> yeah. And Charlie Sheen says, I said kick him to me, Pele. <laughs> If they remade this movie, they would have to change that joke to, I said, kick him over to me, Mia Ham. Kick him over to me, Megan Rapinoe. <laughs>
And the clerk then goes to the back of the store and kicks it back towards him, but again, too hard. So the guns just skid back to the cops who originally put them down. And they lean down to pick him up to hand it to Charlie Sheen. And he's like, no, you guys don't pick up the guns. Moron, you pick up the guns and hand them to me. And it's actually, I think, kind of a funny bit. Any convenience store clerk worth a damn would pick up one of these two standard-issued Glock 22s and pop a cap into Charlie Sheen's leg and then be heralded as a hero. The, in, the real story of this is that the <laughs> mentally deficient cashier gets the gun, starts firing wildly, and kills both Charlie Sheen, Christy Swanson, and one of the cops before he is eventually gunned down. I would love to see that movie. Yeah, that's the Tarantino version. <laughs> it's going to be great, okay? <laughs> the cashier's gonna, just going to point the gun at the camera and it's bang, 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 bang. Down goes Charlie Sheen. Down goes Christy Swanson. Blood everywhere. Close up of her I'm feet. thinking it's basically Clerks 3, which is on the books. Yeah. And at the end, you know, Jay and Silent Bob show up and he's like, snickety witchety, who wants to get their cock suck? Uh-huh. <laughs> I wasn't even supposed to shoot here today. This clerk picks up the guns and he goes over and puts them into Charlie Sheen's jacket pockets. And as he's doing this, like the clerk is holding the guns and they're shaking in his hands. And the, this bow tie clerk is just failing everyone. He's failing his employer. He's failing the onlooking officers. But you cannot trust people in bow ties. I cannot stress this enough. Couldn't trust Buttigieg to bring home a nomination, could you, Chad? Both the tie-wearing little mayor fuck. Charlie Sheen pulls out one of the guns, and he puts it to Christy Swanson's head, and he orders everybody, down on the ground, including you, bow tie guy, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, and Tom Bergeron. And then Charlie Sheen, he goes to leave the store with his hostage, Christy Swanson, and the gun that is not being used to commit a kidnapping falls out. Out of Charlie Sheen's jacket pocket, the gun goes off. It shoots an icy machine, which explodes with red liquid. I'm um, scaring the bejesus out of everybody. And during this whole time, Christy Swanson doesn't say or do anything. She doesn't emote. And I'm going to say that at best, her character might be in shock. At worst, Christy Swanson was just kind of bored with this scene because she doesn't really have anything to say or anything to do. Yeah, this summer, slush puppy is death in a cup. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't resist. No, I, you're right. Like, there's one line Christy Swanson has late in the movie that is just a throwaway of like, I'm self-empowered. And the rest of the movie, <laughs> she's just... Her being in the passenger seat is a metaphor for her role in the film. Yes. She is just along for the ride and at one point fucks him. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> They're on their way out. Charlie Sheen shoots the cop, uh, the cop car's tire. To Big difference there. Yes. <laughs> and then they steal her red BMW. Uh-huh. And then we cut from our hero <laughs> to uh, Henry Rollins and Josh Mustel, who are cops in a patrol car, doing a ride along with a, a show called The Fuzz that is a very clear reference to the show cops it is a producer and a cameraman along for the ride and i just want to say for anyone who's interested that Bo and i have watched literally hundreds of hours of the television show cops together and seeing this knockoff framing device in this film is a little bit offensive i i think it works pretty well uh i wasn't offended i was delighted i thought it was dopey I like it because it showcases Rollins hamming for the camera, mm -hmm. which is maybe my favorite part of this dumb movie is, yeah. is him playing like, and it gets progressively crazier. The shit he says to the camera, but it starts off with him saying like they're Newport beach cops, Newport beach, California. And he's like, you know, we get as much crime as New York does proportionally speaking, of course immediately josh mustel is like no we don't you know like he doesn't say that but it's clear that he thinks that rollins is full of shit too and let's just say real quick for those who don't know who henry rollins is or josh mustel henry rollins is was the front man for black flag and 
Josh Mostel was the son of Broadway legend Zero Mostel, who was Max Bialystok in the original version of The Producers. And I only mention this because The Producers is a very good movie and The Chase is not a very good movie. <laughs> That's right. And Henry Rollins is also, of course, the frontman for Rollins Band, um, has done a million spoken word albums and TV specials. And like the guy just doesn't ever stop working. He is one of those guys that's sort of uh, ubiquitous. You, whether you know it or not, you have seen or heard Henry Rollins, whether it's voice work and cartoons or whatever. He's everywhere. Yeah. He is also famously very anti-establishment and very much anti-cop. And so the, kind of the joke of this movie was you have Henry Rollins playing a cop, which he has said on a number of occasions he despises as an institution. Yeah, he's kind of playing this amalgamation of stereotypes. He's this real alpha male who's just sort of popping his neck and, you know, spouting off all kinds of crazy, over-the-top, just law enforcement nonsense. Right. They're spewing this shit to the camera and they get a call saying, hey, there's this red BMW. Uh, it looks like somebody took a hostage. You're the closest patrol car. Get after him. So they are now in pursuit. And Rollins is like, ha, ha, you're lucky day. Ha, ha. They, they take off after him. And then we cut inside the BMW where he's telling like Christy Swanson, like, hang on to the wheel for a second. I'm trying to get this jacket off. And he says, you know, he's going to let her go as soon as he can. He's just like, I just, I just got to think for a second, right? Uh. You can have this car if you just let me go. And Charlie Sheen says, that's very generous of you, but you're my insurance policy now. And then Charlie Sheen, he pops a cigarette in his mouth and he presses down on the cigarette lighter that's in the car. And how crazy is it to think that cigarette lighters were standard issue in cars pre-1996? Isn't that nuts? The change, the sea change in the way smoking is viewed is one of the greatest like cultural shifts we've ever seen. That would be like putting a, like a fresh needle dispenser in a car or a mini kegerator to keep your draft beer at just the right temperature as you drive around town consuming beverages. <laughs> I've sent so many letters to the major car companies about that and they never respond. Yeah, I think that's a custom job. I think you just, I don't think you go to the manufacturers for that. Charlie Sheen says, this is a nice car. It's got a phone in it. That's really fancy in the mid-1990s. Where'd you get this car? Because surely you, a woman, don't have the means to purchase this kind of automobile on your own. And Christy Swanson says, my dad bought it for me. And Sheen says, I knew it. You women aren't smart enough to generate your own income to pay for such a luxurious automobile. Only men have the mental faculties to earn enough money. to." And then about this time, the cigarette lighter pops up and Christy Swanson just grabs it and jams it into Charlie Sheen's neck, burning a permanent scar of concentric circles into his throat below his right ear. Yeah. And the movie does a good job of making sure that that's there the entire time. Like, that is just a permanent wound for him the rest of the movie, <laughs> uh, which I also like. And then um, he starts swerving, and Rollins and Mostel are like, this guy's going crazy. The lighter then falls between his legs while he's pointing his gun at her. He's like, what did you do that for? She's like, oh, my God, I was just, you were being so mean to me. He's like, well, get rid of it. And she grabs the lighter and throws it out the window and I can really relate to this moment where he's like, what did you do that for? <laughs> How am I supposed to smoke for the rest of the movie? Right. As a former smoker, the idea of somebody just throwing your lighter out the window is like, what the fuck are you doing? Do you understand how uncomfortable you have made this trip for both of us now? We then get a car chase scene where Charlie Sheen just sort of runs across what appears to be a college campus. And there are now two police cars in pursuit. And the car chases in this movie, at least early on, are shot with a lot of up close shots of the cars. And there's a lot of whipping and panning of the camera. And the filmmakers attempt to sort of fake the action of a real car chase by not letting you focus on anything that's happening. If you're not paying attention, you'll really think, hey, this is exciting. But if you really squint your eyes, you'll realize, hey, nothing's happening here at all. Uh, and the movie does that a lot. And and 
I at least give it some props for trying, but yeah, it's it's not very effective. Dude, there's a lot of these car chase scenes that look like they were filmed in the parking lot at Grant Duncan Ford. You know what I mean? Like with the, with a wind machine, like the shit with the guy in the helicopter, you're like, dude, you're clearly on some rooftop somewhere. You're not flying anywhere. He is my favorite guy in the, in the movie though, because all his line deliveries are the exact same. It's just... Whoa, did you see that? <laughs> let's, let's anyway, let's we'll get to that guy. Anyway, during this chase off, Henry Rollins says to the fake cop screw, I feel like a cross between Bruce Springsteen and Sylvester Stallone. And I was just like, What? Yeah, he tells the guy, I guess my favorite thing about being a cop is, I don't know, the respect and power the position commands. <laughs> Which is, again, a funny line, not just because it's it's Rollins. I mean, it's particularly funny because it's Rollins, but also just like, yes, this is, look, I know this guy, you know, like I. I think you're, are you related to this guy? I am related to this guy. <laughs> I bought him a Motley Crue album for Christmas as a kid, this guy. <laughs> and as I'm watching, I'm just like, yep, that's my cousin. We cut back to the red BMW and Christy Swanson says, look. I'm going to throw up because I get car sick. And Charlie Sheen says, well, stick your head out the window and puke. Before we get to the puking, Chad, uh -huh. here's one of the top three weirdest line deliveries in this movie. Okay. Where uh, she says, stop driving so fast. And he goes, what? Are you mad? Look, the question, are you mad? Does not belong in the movie The Chase. No, and nor should it ever be said by someone who doesn't have a British accent. Right. It belongs in black and white horror movies or descriptions of dogs. And that is it. <laughs> and anyway, yeah, but like you said, he tells her to put the, her head out the window. And he's just like, if you're going to be sick, just be sick out there. And she vomits <laughs> out the window. And But what would you estimate is the number of gallons of puke that comes out of her mouth? A solid five. It's it's a full bucket of just slop, mashed potatoes and milk and peas just hurled out the back of some truck onto the windshield of this patrol car. It splashes all over this cop car. I mean, it is a wave of green and gray sludge that just covers the windshield of this automobile and the vomit it's almost equal to the amount of marshmallow that engulfed walter peck at the end of ghostbusters it is voluminous if she really had produced that you would also see a femur strike the car what would she have to eat to produce this much green vomit it's just two gallons of milk and nothing but green Lucky Charms marshmallows. My guess was 10,000 Sour Patch Kids and a drum of Nickelodeon slime. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you can buy that stuff for a song now. <laughs> Here the movie explains to us why we're only going to have a limited number of police cars involved in this chase. As we find out that the majority of police officers in Los Sandimos or wherever we are, they're all at a funeral for another officer that died in a different movie that had more respect than the movie we're watching has limbeck the guy who is having the funeral that day was part of like the conversation or like a much better <laughs> movie <laughs> remember when he was involved with that existential story of surveillance and life in this modern age boy sure sure would have been nice to be part of that story that's why henry rollins is the only guy who's working this day like yeah don't invite him He's on patrol today. He'll demand to give the eulogy, and it will be all about how Limbeck was an ass-kicking super soldier. How many crunches he can do without causing his rectum to prolapse or some <laughs> shit like that. We cut to police HQ, and our movie's police chief is now informed that the woman who was kidnapped in this car is the daughter of Dalton Voss. That's right, the Dalton Voss, or as the movie calls him, the Donald Trump of Los San Demos, or again, wherever the hell we are. Yeah. And it's kind of funny that by calling him that, it sort of gives his character some clarity and depth and legitimacy, because 
If this movie took place now and they said that Dalton Voss is the Donald Trump of wherever the hell we are, it takes on maybe a slightly different meaning, you know? Because as we get to know this character, he comes across as this self-absorbed, rich, well, maybe rich, divorced asshole who cares very little about his children's well-being and more about the events that impact him directly. And he has aspirations for running for higher political office. You know what? I, I think all of this holds true in this movie. There's a lot of things about this movie that are more true than you would like. It's it's like when you recognize things from the movie Idiocracy, where you're like, well, that shouldn't happen. <laughs> like nothing in real life should mimic that of the chase. And yet it does. It does. Yeah, so we've got a real blue-collar kind of police chief here. You know, he's like the old dude in the suspenders and the pinstripe shirt. And balding, gray hair, blue-veined as he's just like, what, what, what? You know, that, that kind of police chief that we really haven't seen since like a Sharky's machine. Uh, which, in, in shame on us for not doing more police chiefs on this show. But... He's on a Stairmaster, and when the, the cop comes in, is like, it's Dalton Voss's daughter, and this is where he's like, who? Dalton Voss? We cut to the car with Rollins and Mostel, and that's where Mostel says he's the, the Donald Trump of, of California. And while all this is going on, there's a real shit heel guitar and drum soundtrack playing. Mm-hmm, says you. <laughs> I really like it. I'm the kind of shit heel that this appeals to. And this is where Sheen is like, you know what? I'm going to Mexico. And then Christy Swanson says, through her puke-scented breath, stop the car and let me out. I don't want to go to Mexico. It is gross. And Charlie Sheen says, look, sweetheart, I'm in a bind. We're getting on the freeway. Cut back to the cop car, and they're like, uh-oh, if he goes to the freeway, this is bad because the stakes are heightened, which is the old Hollywood adage of tell, don't show. This movie here really takes a page or two or a thousand from the O.J. Simpson car chase that had happened just prior no. to the production of this motion picture. This this predated it by three months. No, the O.J. chase was before this. Hang on, I'm going to look this up. June 17th, 94. Same year, but this came out three months before it. This movie doesn't borrow from O.J. Simpson. This movie predicts O.J. Simpson. Adam Rifkin may be some kind of shithead cocaine-fueled Nostradamus. No, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> you know what? Early in my career, I worked at an NBC affiliate, and we had the raw feed from other NBC affiliates across the country. And this was during the heyday where California would broadcast live police chases um, on TV just to get ratings, which I think sort of helped to fuel the the underpinning of this motion picture. And I remember one day being at work, and this was a point where they there was really a a trend in not showing these live police chases because they typically ended badly. And there was one that came on TV and myself and a few other people gathered around and watched a police chase in Texas where these cops were chasing after this guy who had robbed a bank or done something bad. Long story short, at the end of it, I saw a man get gunned down by police officers and killed on live television. And it was shocking to realize I just saw a man executed right in front of me. Yeah, yeah, that's terrifying. I don't have a joke. Moving here. on. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that explains all the suicide notes. So the tra there's now a traffic copter above them that is filming the chase. It's a, a guy, it's our, our hero in the sky who's uh -huh. like, well, you know, it's just a, a typical morning on the I-5. Oh, wow. Look at what's happening here. Can you see this back in the studio? And this cameraman slash reporter, because he's working double duty, is played by Rocky Carroll, who Bo was last seen on Pick 6 Movies in The Ladies' Man, Episode 2, excuse me, The Ladies' Man, Season 2, Episode 5, where he was eating pickled human shit also known as Back Bottom Gristle Oh, he was the rival. Okay. Uh -huh. In this, though, he is just jumping to the conclusion. He's like, hey, if these cops are chasing this guy like this, he must have done something. Am I right, everybody? <laughs> I will say this whole bit with the media in pursuit of the chase and the ridiculous extents people are going to try to get shots and interviews and stuff like that. One thing I legitimately like about this movie is that it has a point of view. It has a perspective. It is clearly making fun of just what you're talking about, of the, this uh, sensationalist trend in the news, which, again, it was a valid criticism then, 
and certainly one now. I give it credit for that. I felt like this movie was trying to include hints of Heathers or natural born killers or maybe like pump up the volume where it felt like it had something it was trying to say. But at the end of this movie, I was like, you didn't have anything to say. You were just doing a bunch of stupid shit. You didn't have a point. Does it come to a good conclusion? No. It doesn't come to a conclusion at all. It doesn't say the media covering this is bad. It's just like, here's a bunch of dopey nonsense But they're always that presented, presented in the movie as buffoons. Like, every, every newscaster is presented as a bit of a goof to one degree or another. Like, it's not necessarily that it's making a fine point about it. Like, the way it treats the cops as being overly aggressive and somewhat clownishly aggressive in their in their way it, it treats the media as being sort of clownishly aggressive in pursuit of this story and sensationalist and it's kind of the i mean we'll get to it but there's a whole scene where charlie sheen kind of tells off a reporter and whatnot but i think it has at least that point of view even if it's not wholly successful which i would agree <laughs> it's not because it's the chase and what i would say to that is i appreciate you clarifying what the movie is trying to do and at the same time saying it failed to do all of that sure it does have the perspective. But so a semi is uh, swinging around as the car chase is going on around it. And uh, it nearly overturns and starts swinging wildly back and forth. And the back door opens up of the semi of the trailer. And it's a medical supply <laughs> trailer. And fro- you're so entertained I by this movie. I really am. And frozen corpses just come spilling out of the back of it. And we get a uh-huh. couple of pretty good shots of police cars just running over corpses on the freeway. As well as one, and I do like this gag, uh, one of the corpses just lands on the patrol car that Rollins and uh, Mostel are in. And so Josh Mostel climbs out and just starts clubbing it with a billy club until it falls off. And I think that's a funny gag. Were these corpses just tossed in the back of this refrigerated truck the way a college student packs up at the end of spring classes <laughs> to head home for the summer? Yeah. I mean, they're just, when the door opens up, they just tumble out like a bunch of beach balls. It's just a a fire line from the morgue to this truck of just people handing corpses down and tossing them willy-nilly into the back just ra- loosely wrapped in plastic because <laughs> when it hits the police car it's just a frozen face smushed against the window this movie also uses a narrative device of including newsroom anchors to help progress the plot along from different point of views and we see this anchor woman who at first i thought was a uh, fox news's own gretchen carlson but it turned out that it was a different news anchor um, her name was brie walker who was a reporter in San Diego and Los Angeles. She went on to fall on hard times. She also had this genetic condition, which created a deformity in her hands and her feet to where she had like only two fingers, like her thumb and her pinky. Oh my God. I don't know what her feet look like, but that's different. Oh yeah, that's crazy. So they're having this conversation with the the traffic guy, who again is just totally making shit up. They, they've confirmed that this is Natalie Voss, who's in the car, the daughter of Dalton Voss, the Trump guy. Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, there's no way this was an accident. She was definitely targeted. We have no evidence of that whatsoever, but pretty sure from up here, that's what we're seeing. Back to you, not Gretchen Carlson. We cut back down to the car and Charlie Sheen says, no loud screaming when corpses are flying across the freeway and try not to burn my dick with a lighter. And then Christy Swanson says, stop waving that gun in my face. I don't like that. And Charlie Sheen says, you're a brat. And Christy Swanson says, you don't know me. You can't kidnap someone and expect them to be cute and nice. You're a terrorist. And then Charlie Sheen says, I'm not a terrorist. Terrorists have ratty beards and they blow up airports. And little did Charlie Sheen know that on April 19th, 1995, the definition of terrorist would forever be rewritten when Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols drove a truck bomb up to the federal building in Oklahoma City. Didn't see that coming, did you, the chase? Not so smart now, are you? This was an innocent time, Bo, filled with stereotypes and bigotry. It's not like today, you know, where we're an enlightened people and we're more tolerant of others. <laughs> yeah, it is an enlightened <laughs> age we live in. Christy Swanson says, get rid of the gun. I hate guns. And so Charlie Sheen just takes the gun and tucks it up under his leg. Right, he just points the gun at his dick and is like, huh, this will be safe here. <laughs> you're like, wait, man, like, you, you know, you've got that spot that you put all the parking slips in uh, on the left side of the door. You just take care. You slip it in there. You're done. And don't put it right next to your left ball because you've already had a, a gun go off accidental like 
and already you, right you know you're not good with this christy swanson tells him my dad is dalton voss the dalton voss you know the donald trump of the west coast he builds walls all across mexico and he has mexico pay for them he's very successful yeah and so she's <laughs> like i know you kidnapped me you dickhead and he's like hey wait a second you're the daughter of the dalton voss oh boy and she's like what you were stalking me and he's like, oh, don't flatter yourself, kid. And I like it when people of the same age call someone else kid, which, you know, is clearly diminutive when you're talking to a woman who you have kidnapped. I like it when people call somebody else dickhead. That's a phrase that really fell out of fashion that we need to bring back. Look, there are plenty of dickheads around. It's time we start putting a label to them. We cut back to police HQ and the Dalton boss shows up wanting answers. He comes in and he's like, I want answers. Why isn't my daughter safe? This is all bullshit. I want my daughter out of this high speed chase. What is happening? It is a disgrace. It's sad. Fake news. Yeah, and the chief is like, look, we're going to get your daughter home safe, I promise. And he's like, if there is so much as one hair on her head that has been hurt, one hair, you know how I value my hair. I will bring fire and fury like you've never known, big time. Because this guy is a loser, and I'm a winner. That's what people are telling me. It's what I heard. Hey, I've got two words for you if you do not get my daughter back. Uh, you're fired. <laughs> Perhaps you're familiar. There's an all call that goes out to the cops that Charlie Sheen is armed and dangerous, and he's kidnapped the daughter of Dalton Voss. And we see that Officer Henry Rollins, he gets his, like, cop boner. And uh, now we have three police cars in pursuit of the red BMW, whereupon an officer decides that he's going to pull out a shotgun to shoot Charlie Sheen. Is that his plan or is he going to shoot his tires? I don't know. It's a real good question. And yeah. and the, That's not in the police officer handbook, is it? No. <laughs> and it, like, it's just this dude. I don't like the looks of him. And, and cocking his shotgun and being like, hey, I'm going to drive up on the driver's side and just shoot my shotgun randomly into the side. What do you think? And Rollins is like, good idea. I'll go up on the passenger side and box him in for you. Charlie Sheen sees the cop with the shotgun and shits himself. So he pulls that Glock from under his leg, the one that he stole from a police officer earlier. And he's like, hey, I'm going to shoot this cop first. And then the red BMW hits a rock on the interstate and Charlie Sheen accidentally fires a bullet into the tire of the shotgun cop's car, which causes this car to sort of fishtail and eventually flip and roll over. Yeah, my exact notes were it flips over, which sends another van going all flippity floppity, which I think is how most traffic is reported. There's no way that the cops in that car are not dead. When that other delivery truck T-bones them, yeah, like multiple people are dead now, Bo. Yes, yes, we have our first fatalities in the movie for sure. It was here that I realized there are only two ways that this movie could end. One, Charlie Sheen's character will end up back in prison for the rest of his life, or laying on a gurney with a needle in his arm or maybe gunned down in a field somewhere which is three choices kind is kind of sort of what happens so, but not really so the we cut back up to the chopper where our our friendly neighborhood news guy gives us another whoa did you see that <laughs> yeah he goes boy by the way he shot out that tire he must be a marine sharpshooter or something so we got a guy who for sure captured natalie boss on purpose marine sharpshooter uh real dangerous fellow we got on our hands here totally viable information that we are giving everyone here not making any of it up and then we have a moment where we get the real scoop on charlie sheen back at the police station because uh the bosses uh it's dalton boss and his trophy wife again no no any similarities uh, to anyone living or dead purely coincidental they're going down to this computer room in the station where they pull up this hilarious mugshot of charlie sheen where he's got this giant handlebar mustache and a hawaiian mm -hmm. shirt on like he's the jeff lebowski before picture he looks like h.i mcdonough yes and they're like yeah uh, his name is jack hammond and he escaped from this prison transfer uh being taken to rikers because he was convicted of an armed robbery so it turns out the the chief uh, was notified because they put out like a 
when he escaped, whatever bolt and goes out. And Voss is like, wait a second. Are you telling me that you knew this dangerous individual was on the loose and you did nothing for 24 hours? And he's like, yeah, I guess, Mr. Voss. Sorry about that. It's uh, him again threatening to have this guy's job, which is his whole move in this movie. So we cut down to the red BMW and uh, Charlie Sheen is in shock that he caused a police car to flip, roll over, get hit by a bread delivery truck and cause the death of multiple people. And Charlie Sheen says, I didn't mean to do that. And Christy Swanson says, what did you think was going to happen when you shoot a cop car? And then Charlie Sheen says, shut up. Your voice is like nails. And Christy Swanson says, what are you saying? I have a shrilly voice. Well, excuse me for not being the perfect hostage. And Charlie Sheen says, shut up. Things are too violent. I hate violence. And Christy Fawson says, you're the epitome of violence. You're a gun shooting, gun killing maniac kidnapper. And then Charlie Sheen just grabs her arm violently and he says, I'm not violent. There's a difference between being violent and being driven to violence said every drunken stepdad during his initial arraignment hearing when <laughs> things went a little too far with his old lady's kids the other night. So Charlie Sheen says, look, you don't know anything about me. The system doesn't believe me. Why should you? I was convicted of a crime I didn't commit, and I promptly escaped from a maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, I'm still wanted by the government, and I survive as a soldier of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find me, maybe you can hire the Sheen team. Just him tossing grenades and seeing like three guys in camo pants flying up 20 feet in the air. Oh, simpler times, Chad. Christy Swanson says, I don't believe you. <laughs> right. Why should she? And... <laughs> And then the phone rings, which scares the shit out of Charlie. She's what? Huh, what? What is that? What the hell? Yeah. Is that a bomb? <laughs> which button do I push? I don't want to die. Well, not right now. Maybe later. She's like, oh my God, just push send. You fucking dildo. You push send to answer the phone? That doesn't make any sense. It's a different time, Chad. It's the year of 19. Blah, 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 blah. If you want to shut down your PC, you hit the start button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Engineers don't take the end user into consideration when designing products idiots stupid engineers they'll figure it out that's uh all software engineers <laughs> there's a breadcrumb channel for god's sake jesus charlie sheen answers the phone and it's the police chief and he's there with dalton voss and his wife and the police chief says oh, charlie sheen it's time to end this son you're in enough trouble already and Charlie Sheen says, no way, Jose, I'm not believing your lies. And then Charlie Sheen and Christy Swanson, they're in that red BMW. And we see there are three police cars behind them weaving back and forth. Bo, it looks like they are getting a police escort somewhere yeah. more than it does like a high speed police chase. Yeah, like you could just put this backdrop on a loop for most of this movie of police cars slightly moving left to right behind them with lights flashing. And they do. Yes. And it's how do you make a movie that is nothing but one long car chase exciting? The answer, Chad, may surprise you, but it's you don't. It turns out that it's not always exciting. Sometimes it's okay. Most of the time it's not. Dalton Voss is listening in over this speakerphone and he's had enough. And he says, Charlie Sheen, this is Dalton Voss. If you harm my daughter, I'm going to kill you, son of a bitch. No collusion. You're a loser. And Charlie Sheen is like, hey, look, I don't want your money. I don't need your planes, Dalton Voss. And he's like, wait a second. You don't want money? Then uh, what do you want? And Charlie Sheen is like, Nothing. I don't want anything. And then one of my favorite things happens where the missus steps in here uh -huh. and is like, Natalie, honey, it's it's your mother. Did he try anything funny? What was she imagining when she said that? Rape. That if, rape. Of course she was imagining rape. Like he was touching her private parts? Yes. Of course, Chad. Maybe he was driving around with his dick out. <laughs> yeah. That would be the least surprising thing I think I, I would have ever heard. I'll tell you, here's a funny little story about being a, a single guy in your 40s, Chad. So I do uh, some of the online dating, right? Easy way to meet people. And the number of times that 
I have met someone through the online dating and one of the first interactions I have with them is, by the way, thank you for not immediately sending me a picture of your dick Mm -hmm. is terrifying. That is apparently so rampant, it warrants a thank you when it doesn't happen in the first three exchanges. Though if you're anything, you're a gentleman. It just never occurred to me that that was an icebreaker. Look at this. But now, <laughs> it's it's my go-to. <laughs> Christy Swanson says to Mrs. Voss, uh, no, Yvonne, oh. he's not tried anything funny. And you're like, did she just call her mom Yvonne? Oh, shit, this is getting good. Chad, you had the misfortune of having parents in a dedicated relationship, and you never really got the joys of mm-hmm. the nuclear option of going to a step-parent's first name. Right. Oh, it's satisfying. You don't do it much (laughs) in in certain situations, but every now and again, when you give them a good no Yvonne, that is a loaded Yvonne. Here, Dalton Vall says, your mother and I will get you out of this, sweetie. Did you tell your kidnapper you have bone spurs? It's gotten me out of a lot of things, okay? (laughs) Christy Swanson says, no, dad. And by the way, Yvonne is my stepmother. And you're like, oh, shit, this got even better. And he's like, look, now is not the time. You're getting a little mouthy. Put the man back on the phone. Let me deal with him. Your mother and I are supposed to be in Paris, France. It's a very luxurious place. We're going to be going to the Voss Towers Hotel next to Voss Casino. It's closing in two weeks. I make the best deals. What's your problem, Christy Swanson? I've given you everything you want. What is your problem? And then the stepmom leans in and says, The problem, Dalton, is that your daughter's spoiled. And Charlie Sheen kind of busts in and he's like, Hey, listen, your daughter's really going through something here. Quit being a bunch of selfish assholes. <laughs> and then he just hangs up on Dalton Voss. It was a perfect call. It was the best call. That's what people are telling me. I'm hearing things that my daughter is already released. Um, I think we're on our <laughs> way to pick her up now. Uh, nothing to see. All is well. This is the first time in the movie when we cut to like inside the BMW after he's hung up on her father that Chris- uh-huh. Christy Swanson gives him the, I'm going to fuck him in this car look. Uh, he calls her dad a dickhead. Thanks. she's like, yeah. yeah, he is a dickhead. You know what? You and I have a lot in common. We both think my dad's a dickhead. It's getting hot in here. Would you mind if I took off my panties? Oh, wow. We both think my dad's a dickhead. Well, I know we both like driving my car. <laughs> we should be married. <laughs> so at this at this point there are now five police cars and two motorcycles chasing the red bmw and we come back to the tv news and they have this special graphic that they've put together for this unbelievable event that kind of looks like a haunted hayride being hosted by the local jc's and it says terror on the freeway as they're doing their like graphics package and and talking up this you know big car chase we do uh, a dissolve from the screen into another setting, which happens a bunch in this movie too. It's it's the, the essentially the Star Wars wipe of the chase is moving in and out of screens. But we cut to an old fashioned Southern lawyer with suspenders and wire rim glasses, and he looks over uh-huh. and they're like, Jack Hammond has kidnapped Natalie Voss, and he just goes, Oh, Jack, and that's kind of all we get at first. But we are introducing this character of of Jack's. Uh, attorney charlie sheen's attorney in the film so charlie sheen and christy swanson they're just rolling down the freeway and it looks like they're having a pretty casual drive that just happens to involve a bunch of police cars behind them and christy swanson tells charlie sheen nobody has ever talked to my father that way and where did you get that mysterious scar on your neck (laughs) oh wait that's why it was for me well and he says well that's because i'm the only one who doesn't want some from your father and she's like, I don't want anything from my dad, dick. Yeah, you do. You you want his respect. You want to be treated like a, a woman. Yeah, this is where he starts laying the groundwork for the eventual seduction later. But he's, he's really like, no, no, I really understand you. I think uh, you have a lot of positive qualities, especially your boobs. Christy Swanson says, you know, when you have money your whole life, it's not that big of a deal. You're like, what? Yeah. And well, what did she say? Mar- er, no, I almost called him Martin Sheen. Jesus Christ. Charlie Sheen rightly points out. He's like, hey, 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 sister. When you don't have money all your life, it's a very big deal. All right. What kind of point is this movie making here? 
I, I suppose that she's out of touch. I don't, this is a good question. This whole character is like, I don't know what it is you're trying to do, but you have, you have failed at it. And then Charlie Sheen says, so why do you hate your stepmom? And then this conversation just goes on and on. We hear a bunch of boring family bullshit of the Voss family. I didn't care about any of this. So let's cut back to police HQ where Christy Swanson's real mom shows up with some young beefcake on her arm. And then the new stepmom, she gets all catty with the real mom and you're just like me yeah let's see what's gonna happen here yeah and it shot like a literal tennis match where all the cops are like swinging their heads left and right as these women are just pissing at each other and then the chief gets a message that like the cop comes up to him that told him about dalton boss being there uh he's like hey you got a, a the attorney for charlie sheen on the phone and he's like what, what, what? why didn't you tell me right away and he storms off to get the phone and the attorney is like look my client is not a violent man you just need to let me talk to him talk some sense into him I don't know why he's just a Southern lawyer, but he is. It's fine. Here we see on the TV news, there's like five or six cars chasing the red BMW. And the news anchor man, he asks Eye in the Sky traffic reporter Rocky Carroll if Rocky can get a shot inside the BMW to see if Christy Swanson is all tied up or maybe she's restrained. And the way this guy says it with such curious glee, I'm like, this dude is most likely into some real fringe stuff behind clothes closed doors yeah he's dipping behind the counter chad that's what the kids call it <laughs> back in the car charlie sheen is with christy swanson and he tunes the radio and the song macho man by the village people comes on and these two idiots just start singing along and then they start sort of arm dancing and I thought that they had confused Macho Man with YMCA due to their outstretched choreography, but they quickly realized that they're doing the wrong dance and they need to tamp that shit down. Yeah, it's real dumb. It is one of the worst bonding moments you'll ever see in a movie. And it kind of culminates with Charlie Sheen saying, I always like the cowboy the best. The phone in the car rings and Charlie Sheen answers it. Domino's Pizza. He's a scamp, Bo. He is. He's a little troublemaker. And <laughs> it's his lawyer. He's like, Charlie Sheen, you need to let that girl go and come back and we can figure something out. Let the system do its job. Charlie Sheen says, hey, look, man, I'm a kidnapper now. I'm going away for life. Screw the system. And the lawyer's like, no, no, no. Massage the system, bend the system, but don't screw the system. You tweak the system, you flick it, you blow on it, kiss it, you rub it, you nudge it. You roll it in, in a semicircle and then put your thumb, and just apply a little bit of pressure. And that's what you do with the system. And then you tell the system... It's going to be okay. I'll be here in the morning when you wake up too. See, what the system wants to know is that you're going to stick around. You feel that system? <laughs> That's gentle breeze in my breath system. <laughs> it's okay that you got a kid system. I like it. I like that Charlie Sheen is considering the fact that he is a prison escapee. He has felonious behavior from his driving on the road. He stole two guns from police officers. He attempted robbery at the convenience store. He shot at a cop on the highway. He clearly killed at least one police officer when that patrol car crashed earlier. And Charlie Sheen says, hey man, look, I'm going to Mexico, lawyer guy. Hanging up the phone now. Click. Chad, the way he puts it is, I'm going Latin, chief. Oh, it's so bad and wonderful. You could have stopped it bad. <laughs> and the, the lawyer's like, no, no, we can beat this. But don't worry about it, Charlie Sheen. And he's like, look, thanks for being the one that did what no one else would do. You believed in me. And the lawyer's like, hey, stop talking crazy and, and bad acting. We can get you out of there. And Charlie Sheen says, I'm already out, Ari. I'm already out. Click. <laughs> And then they cut to Christy Swanson for that one shot of her like, God, I want to fuck him so bad. And I mean, it is, she has given him the dirtiest, filthiest fuck eyes in this scene. It's the best. We see now eight police cars are involved in the chase, plus our two motorcycles in hot pursuit. And then we're back in the BMW and the phone rings again, and it's a news station. And the reporter says that he wants to know, hey, Charlie Sheen, what are you going to do when your car runs out of gas? And Charlie Sheen says, I hope that my desperation and Christy Swanson's fear is enough to entertain your viewers. That's what it's all about, isn't it, right? We wouldn't want the viewers to change the fucking channel, would we? And then Charlie 
Tommy Sheen just rips the phone out of the cradle, and it's a real Nick Cage moment. And Christy Swanson is like, I am both horrified and turned on by this sudden violence from him. Because she likes his violent outburst as seen when he grabs her wrist and whatnot. He's a mess, man. Well, yes. He's got mental problems. And he goes, I'm sorry about that, but, you know, what's this world coming to, you know? That's the kind of thing that pushes a man to violence. You know, getting a telephone call. Or when your woman doesn't have the kind of food you like or at the right temperature. By the way, your breath smells like an asshole. Did you throw up? Oh, wait, never mind. Earlier in the movie, he tells her to chew some gum because, and I quote, your breath smells like my grandma's feet. You're just like, ugh. Then what a horrible thing to say to anybody, (laughs) much less the woman you just kidnapped. Anyway, so enter Anthony Kiedis and flee. We need a monster truck filled with vigilantes. Can we get something stupid in this movie stat? And whipping into the frame is Anthony Kiedis and Flea in a monster truck who are just uh-huh. morons chain smoking inside this uh, th- this monster truck. There's a pirate flag <laughs> waving outside. There's a miniature voodoo doll head and a disco ball hanging from the rearview mirror. And they're doing this very affected burnout California kind of, you know, we're going to do this, Dale. You know, that kind of voice. Mm -hmm. It's real stupid. Their whole plan is get her, as we see so often on this show, where they're going to ram the BMW to drive it into the guardrails in an effort to get on TV. That is their whole goal here. We know this because Flea says, you think we're going to get on TV, Dale? And Anthony Kiedis replies, you know we are. You know we are. It is gloriously stupid back in officer henry rollins's patrol car the tv producer and cameraman they're still interviewing uh, henry rollins and josh mostel the latter of which here admits that he once killed someone and he says it didn't feel the way i thought it would which Bo, let's examine this lewis carroll riddle of words number one he thought it would feel good to kill a man and instead it made him feel terrible mm-hmm Or he thought it would feel terrible to kill a man, and instead it made him feel good. Either way, it's a lose-lose. I think it's the other way, because it's preceded by Rollins, when when the producer says, either of you ever shot somebody, and Rollins, when when he replies, is real disappointed, and says, not yet. (laughs) <laughs> like he's really looking forward to it and then yeah josh mustel la- launches into his more maudlin story and you're like eh, I-, I think it's the wrong movie for this he says it felt shitty it felt wrong but then he says i would do it again if i had to it's my job right and like what is our movie trying to say because it's saying nothing i just want to understand what it's trying to say so that i can understand how it's failing i think what what they're trying to say in this scene is that the sort of machismo that Rollins is evidencing is in contrast to someone who has done the thing that Rollins is so excited to do, who is saying, no, that's not what it's really like. The, the, the human call, like I'm giving this movie way more credit, but I was about to say, Bo, you should go coach five-year-olds playing soccer. <laughs> Like, you're doing great. I know you suck and you're awful, but you're the best. (laughs) I was originally cast in Ladybugs, Chad, and I lost (laughs) out to fucking Rodney Dangerfield, that fucking prick. (laughs) No talent hack. Right. What has he ever done? <laughs> the cars are now stacking up, Chad, at the Mexico border because we're... Uh-huh. There's a blockade. Yeah, we're closing in on the finale. And so it's a bunch of cops and news crews and the sun is starting to set, except in the next scene where we cut back to the BMW and it's like 2 p.m. <laughs> again. Because, uh, you know, hey, we're, we're doing this on the quick people. Christy Swanson is reaching into her purse and she immediately is like, Hi, Kiba! And just karate chops her hand. He's not a violent man, Bo. <laughs> oh, you made me do that that time, Christy Swanson. <laughs> Smack that ass back to Nutbush. She says, hey, I was just going to offer you some gum, you dickhead. And he's like, oh, well, it could have been mace for all I knew. And she's like, if I had mace, I would have already used it on you. You suck as a criminal. And he's like, that's what I'm trying to tell everybody. She asks him here, so why are you even on the run? And Charlie Sheen says, two years ago, I'm at, I'm at home watching the Dodgers game. And Christy Swanson interrupts, I hate the Dodgers. <laughs> it's like, shut up. Right, and he immediately he's like, hey, you want to hear this or not? And <laughs> she's like, oh, yeah, sorry, fine. Don't be a dick. Charlie Sheen says, so I'm watching the Dodgers. And on the other side of the city, some guy robs a bank dressed like a clown. And at the time, the only job I could get was playing a clown at a kid's birthday party. Which, Bo, 
We got to pause for a moment and savor the thought of Charlie Sheen as a clown at a child's birthday party. I mean, you don't have to imagine that hard, Chad, because we at least get him in the clown outfit. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> it's super bizarre. I mean, it's not as bizarre as the love scene we're about to get to. Yeah. In this scene, Charlie Sheen says, so one of my neighbors knows that I dress up as a clown for birthday parties and called the police. And the police showed up, knocked on my door, and they arrested me because I own a clown costume. And I'm thinking you have got to have the shittiest lawyer in the history of lawyers. If the authority's only evidence was the fact that you own a clown costume and you were arrested, put on trial, convicted and sent to prison. Dude, there is more evidence in the denouement of an episode of Scooby-Doo to put someone in jail other than what you've just provided. And there is, as we find out later, direct evidence to the contrary. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where perhaps this has happened somewhere in the history of justice it just yeah, seems like in the 1800s yeah, right like there is more evidence uh for someone convicted of witchcraft than is convicted <laughs> of armed robbery in this film can you imagine how much that old neighbor hated charlie sheen to be like right there's a boy down the street who dresses like a clown i believe that he's the one who robbed all those banks he's also the one who told my cat curly q that he looks a little curious son of a bitch all day long nothing but baseball and the smell of marijuana <laughs> We cut back to the Red Hot Chili Peppers driving around in their monster truck, and they pull up beside the red BMW, which, remember, is being chased by seven or eight patrol cars and two police motorcycles. And you know what? Let's just keep this brief. Flea whips the monster truck hither and yon. It ends up flipping over and rolling, but the Red Hot Chili Peppers escape, but not before the monster truck gets hit by a semi-truck, which just causes a massive explosion on the freeway. And all you need to know is that the red BMW gets away and a lot of the law enforcement that was chasing them do not follow in pursuit. Right. They get kind of stuck in traffic and whatnot. And then we we cut away from all this to the lawyer who is being interviewed and we have a hilariously thick-tongued Ron Jeremy cameo who is mm -hmm. the cameraman in this scene. You know, Ron Jeremy worked at a 7-Eleven where he would duck down and suck his own dick. The hedgehog could do it, Chad. And in this scene, his, his line, this was the best take they got from him. Professional question mark actor, Ron Jeremy. And it's just almost ready, Mr. Jothofton professional exclamation point self later Ron. Jeremy. Sure. He's a good actor for porn. Charlie Sheen's lawyer really sucks because why would he be having a live interview on TV while this chase is happening? In this scene, his lawyer says, I say, I say, the real robber, he cut himself at the scene of the crime and that blood sample was type B positive and my client's blood is HIV positive. It is clearly not a match. I, I actually wrote in my notes here. He tells the audience about the blood being inadmissible because of improper collection, though it completely exonerated his client. And then my note following that is, I actually said that way better than the scene did. <laughs> Little pat on the back in my own notes of like, wow, <laughs> I, I, I outwrote the chase. That's not hard. I mean, look, one arm <laughs> behind my back, Chad. And then writer lost after dark here, Chad. I am a colleague of Mr. Rifkin. I know you are. Christy Swanson. That tells him, like, you know what? You should totally keep fighting like your lawyer said. And he's like, look, I've been fighting, okay? And look where it got me. While you're off having a life full of barbecues and sundresses and kids' PTA meetings and probably some liposuction. I mean, I can definitely see where that neck could really get out of hand in the future. So keep an eye on that. But you, while you're doing all that, I'm going to be a cement room surrounded by murderers and rapists who think I got a cute ass. And sorry, sister, that's just not my style. It is, <laughs> again, a gloriously stupid monologue. She asks him here, Bo, so when were you sentenced for this crime? And Charlie Sheen says, yesterday. Yesterday? The timeline of this movie is incoherent. You're right. And in a real shrug of the screenplay, she says... You know, I don't know why, but I believe you. And then just takes his hand. It's just, again, it's just the screenplay being like, we don't know either, people. They're falling in love, Bo, <laughs> yeah. in love. And he says, that means a lot. 
We're so close to the end of this shitty movie. She is falling in love with him in this scene, Chad, because he is supposed <laughs> to be, again, kind of a lovable asshole. And the only other lovable asshole that comes to mind is, of course, Bill Murray. Right. Which brings us, Chad, to tonight's quiz. Oh. A true and false quiz for you. Mm -hmm. Did Bill Murray do this thing? There are many urban legends of okay. Bill Murray's behavior. Yes. Some of these are true. Some of these are false. Number one, Bill Murray finished third of four in a competitive eating competition in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yes, true. That is false. Damn. He bartended with two members of the Wu-Tang Clan, but would only serve tequila shots no matter what people ordered. True. That is true. Uh, he was appointed an honorary co-pilot on an American Airlines flight and was actually allowed to land the plane on arrival alongside the actual pilot. False. That is false. Yes. He starred in Garfield because he thought the director was one of the Coen brothers. That is definitely true. That is 100% true. And also <laughs> Could hilarious. Could have been in that movie. Yeah. Uh, he now shows up on talk shows unannounced. All his recent guest appearances are on his schedule and for no apparent reason. I hope that that is true. That is false. <laughs> Damn. He bought one of everything at a Taco Bell and gave most of it away to the other diners and staff. Please be true. That is also false. Damn it. He read poetry to a group of construction workers. False. That is true. I, God, I suck at this. <laughs> he attended a house party that he was invited to on a goof and before true. leaving washed all the dishes. True. That is true. Uh, famously annoyed Woody Harrelson on the set of Zombieland because of his, quote, excessive application of head noogies. I will say true. That is false. Damn! He got rid of his agent in favor of an 800 number that he uses to screen movie pitches and decides all of his career choices on the basis of a convincing voicemail. That is true. That is true. And that, Chad, is your uh, Bill Murray quiz. 70 is passing. You did not pass. I think I got three. <laughs> Yeah, which makes me feel good. I feel like I made convincing Bill Murray urban <laughs> legends there. Uh, but the ones that are true are still fucking unbelievable. He's an enigma. He he truly is. We cut into the uh, the car with Rollins and, and Josh Mustel, where Henry Rollins is saying, you know, to anticipate crime, you have to be, I don't know, kind of telepathic, like a, a street prophet. And Josh Mustel is just rolling his eyes at, at Rollins being a moron. And while this is happening, the cameraman starts crawling over Henry Rollins, who is driving, saying he needs to fix his mic, which leads to their car swerving all over the road. And the only reason I bring this up is because it leads to the cameraman or the producer yelling at the cameraman, which culminates with him saying, the producer saying to the cameraman, you stupid little nothing. And it's this mm -hmm. raw ass insult that has no payoff and no context. And it's like, the fuck is going on in this relationship? I didn't make any notes about this scene at all. It doesn't. Because it didn't matter. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. But that's kind of why it's so mind boggling. Of like, When does this ever become a thing? Anyway, meanwhile, a reporter and a cameraman in an effort to get a scoop, Chad, have bunching themselves to a fucking van and mm -hmm. are hanging off of it to get a look inside the car. Yes. And so the reporter pulls up alongside and is like, hey, Natalie Voss, can you give us a thumbs up if you're okay? And Charlie Sheen leans across her and is like, don't worry, I'll answer for you, even if it's just in gestures. And gives a middle finger to the uh, the cameraman and the reporter. And the cameraman is like, oh, can we even show that? And then we cut back to the studio for a surprise Carrie Elwes cameo. Mm -hmm. Just to remind us that he's haunting this season, Chad. Always watching us. This is his fourth appearance on Pick 6 Movies. Yeah. He was in The Bride, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Days of Thunder, and now The Chase. I see him behind my eyelids, Chad. You know, his younger brother is the guy who is the producer in the back seat of Henry Rollins' police car. Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense then. And he is also the producer of this film, his younger brother, not Carrie. Sure, that makes even more sense. Yeah. But their name for the chase is Kidnapped at 100 Miles Per Hour. That's good. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. And we cut back into the BMW where Christy Swanson is totally letting Charlie Sheen know that the runway is clear, if you know what I mean. Yeah, they're having a first date conversation. It is totally like, yeah, I guess my last boyfriend's just, I don't know, I, I they weren't drivers. I don't know if you know what I mean. They, they didn't have gravelly voices or like to rip the phone out of my car, call my dad a dickhead. Those are all the things that I like about guys. 
And he's completely battened this back. And he's like, eh, well, you know, your your father can't be too bad. And she's like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I mean, look how good you turned out. Am I right? At one point, Charlie Sheen, in their conversation, he says, you know, when I was holding that gun to your back in the convenience store, I couldn't help but notice the smell of your hair. And I'm like, you know what? Only Charlie Sheen and Joe Biden can make that sound not creepy enough to end your career. <laughs> and she... Like, is totally down for it. She's like, really? Oh, I didn't, I didn't even notice. But I mean, I was feeling some things too. And it's so weird. My hair, she smelled it, really? It's just juices and berries that I wash it with. But oh my God, you noticed that. <laughs> and then this is where uh, she's like, well, you know, maybe if you hadn't been pointing a gun at me, maybe things could be different. I didn't kidnap you with a gun. It was this, a melted Butterfinger that's been riding under my ass for the duration of the movie. <laughs> Which she immediately opens and starts eating and just like oh i just want your ass candy is that weird is it weird that i want to eat your ass candy you might if i put a little piece in your mouth i'm gonna stick my fingers in your mouth with this candy that tastes like total shit it's it's like dried up hamster turds wrapped up in baker's chocolate Butterfingers, but ignore that because it's my fingers you should worry about, Tiger. Uh, while she's playfully feeding him with chocolate, she's like, Oh my god, my dad would be so embarrassed if he knew that I got. I'm sorry, just licking my fingers right off. It tastes so <laughs> good, it tastes like cigarettes and some gum. Then she's like, He'd be so embarrassed if he knew that I'd been kidnapped with a candy bar. He's probably just trying to spin this for his run for governor, and then cut to him spinning this for a run for governor. Where Ray Wise is just like, So call Ted Turner, tell him I'll give him an exclusive if he gives me some good publicity. This is gonna be big for us. People are telling me I'm the best candidate that's ever been. I'm clearly better than the West Coast version of Barack Obama. No one's even heard of him yet. He's such a loser. They say that they're not even going to bother with the police. They want me to negotiate her out of the car. I said that was a very smart idea. I'm a very stable genius. My ideas are the best. Look, I've got good people around me. It's my secret weapon. Oh, except for all the ones I got rid of. Now it's just people who agree with me, so naturally I'm hearing all about the good things I'm going to do for Natalie Voss. Also, I hear she's my daughter. I think that's very exciting. We then cut to the side of the road where there's a news reporter interviewing the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And my question for you, Bo, is which Flea performance was superior? Um, his performance in this movie or as Marty McFly's co-worker in Back to the Future 2? I think Back to the Future 2 feels a little more reined in, perhaps. I mean, it's so hard to hey, tell. Hey, McFly! <laughs> When, when you're making those calls, Chad, you're riding in the high country, as a wise man once said. We got back to the red BMW, and Christy Swanson, she's putting salve or something on Charlie Sheen's neck branding. She's really loving and caring, and you can see behind them the eight patrol cars still in hot pursuit. And then Christy Swanson, she leans in and she says, you know, I wish we knew each other under different circumstances. Um, Are you married or have a girlfriend? And is it true that if you you go back to prison for like a couple of years you're never gonna have sex with a woman again and charlie sheen says what are you doing and christy swanson says i'm falling in love with you oh it's a groaner chad it's a rough one charlie sheen should have said no what i meant was what are you doing your breath smells like a rotten possum like seriously sweetheart you've got to do something you've got puke pouring down the corners of your mouth i'm thinking of something my grandmother used to say you could knock a vulture off a gut wagon and then the most impossible fuck scene of all time happens, Chad. It's something. It, it is. She starts taking off her clothes and she just climbs on top of him and they fuck at 100 miles an hour while multiple police cars are chasing them. And then visually outside the car, it just turns into time lapse cloud footage and sunsets. Yeah, it's like a tangerine dream light is playing. It's like Tangelo dream <laughs> is playing. And then and then fade to black. And then we just cut back to... Is him. the movie over? The end? No, it doesn't end with a fucking, although all good movies do. The, the best movies, Chad. I know what movies you're watching. It always ends up with the two girls, the stepsisters, finally coming together. 
pee on this mattress. Please tell me that there's not a camera running. Please tell me that there is, and you'll give me a copy of this. They fall in love with the stepbrother, and there's double penetration. It's a classic story. No, no, no. It is nighttime. What? When did it turn to night? It just did, Chad. It just did. And then right. <laughs> they're 10 miles away from Tijuana. Uh, Christy Swanson is just totally in the afterglow of this, nuzzling Charlie Sheen and just being like, so what are you thinking about? We're going to be driving tomorrow, right? I mean, this isn't just a tonight thing. You're still interested in me dropping you off and you giving me this car? Is that a possibility? Look, uh, I think it's only fair that you get out and get me a lighter and hand it to me through the window. <laughs> yeah, she says, we could totally live in Mexico together, you and me. And look, I'm your insurance policy. We'll get money from my dad. We'll just live forever in Mexico. It's like so romantic, you and me. He's like, uh, I don't know. This is all happening a little quick. Wait a second. You notice that th we're the only cars on the road here? I know, it's just you and me on the road together. Just you and me no, and wait, Charlie Sheen. Do the shutting up thing. Hang on a second. No, just think about it. It's just your heart and my heart. Can you feel our hearts beating as one together? That's why there's no cars on the road. Oh, thank Christ there's a blockade ahead. So yeah, there's a, he runs like almost into the blockade, hits the brakes and tells her like, strap in. And... They skid to a stop, like, right as uh, they're about to hit these, like, big earth movers. There's, like, 50 cops waiting for them, Bo. Yeah, and he just stops for a second. He's just like, huh, let me think, let me think, let me think. Meanwhile, <laughs> poof, 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 poof. Those are the snipers, Chad. That is the small muffled report of the sniper rifles ending this man's <laughs> life right then. That's how it should have ended, but it doesn't. So instead, she's like, oh, my God do something i thought i was fucking a take charge kind of guy and he's like oh christ hold on sweetheart yeah i'm gonna back up yeah back that ass up <laughs> he reverses kind of slicing in twain the oncoming police cars as he drives against the traffic and it's a cannonball run ending where police cars are hitting each other and one of them flies over the top of another one mm -hmm. and then uh, charlie sheen then goes off road and we get a, a pretty good car crash there and then he drives through i guess the border fence and then the fee we have one of those moments where we cut from that to people watching this chase and it's the chief and the bosses watching on like one of those old timey portable tvs with an antenna yeah and then a clip from planet of the ape shows yeah and the boy toy that christy swanson's mom brought along just goes monkeys it is what is happening in this movie bro? <laughs> It is one of those moments where you're like, holy shit, man. I can't believe that made it through. I can't that that line made it through the script phase, much less a final <laughs> edit. That is stupid. We cut back to the BMW and it's driving around in circles now with all of the police cars, dozens of them in pursuit in some sort of a ring around the rosy daisy chain. And Charlie Sheen asks Christy Swanson, do you really want to go to Mexico? And Christy Swanson says, yes, yes, a thousand times. Yes, Charlie Sheen, you and me together forever we're gonna have a hundred babies and then there's this moment where there is no dialogue between these two and it is it is really a a lengthy period of time where they don't talk and what i mean by a lengthy period of time it's about four seconds <laughs> for this movie that's a long time yes charlie sheen just stops the car all the cops pull out their guns charlie sheen says Christy Swanson, it's over. I can't let you ruin your life because of me. I care too much about you. And then he takes the Glock that he stole earlier from a cop and sticks it into her purse. And then Christy Swanson says, Charlie Sheen, look, we can totally make this work. And Charlie Sheen says, what say you get out of this car and walk away first and I'll follow you. And then, and then Christy Swanson kind of squirts out a single tear because she's mentally unstable and incapable of expressing true <laughs> human emotions appropriate for these circumstances. And so she gets out of the car and then she walks off and gets into another patrol car where there's all these cops. And then Charlie Sheen just lights up a cigarette and we get this flashback of all of the wacky adventures <laughs> and human deaths that occurred during this film. Uh-huh. It's the best, man. I love a movie that gets nostalgic about the movie that just happened. The only movie that really pulled this off is She's Having a Baby. Yes, but that also, that flashback included stuff we had never seen before. This is just straight up, like, he has a flashback to the car jumping over the other car, like, yeah, that was a good stunt. It's, uh, <laughs> boy, this movie was pretty good now that I look back and think about it. <laughs> All right, everybody ready to go home? <laughs>
it ends with Christy Swanson fucking Charlie Sheen again. He's like, oh, yeah, that was great. Right. That would have been the whole flashback if it were me of just like, oh, I'm going to just sit here and have this smoke and think about the weirdest fuck I ever had. Charlie Sheen gets out of the car and this piano music is playing that's very somber and just like low key. And then just when you think Charlie Sheen can't do anything more stupid in this film, he raises his fingers like a gun and points them at the cops and just gets mowed down in a hail of bullets. Yeah. Charlie Sheen is dead. It's like the end of Butch and Sundance. Yes, it is the end of Butch uh, Cassie and the Sundance Kid of just a hail of gunfire and him sliding dead down the side of the car. But wait, Bo, wait, wait, wait. That was all a dream. Yeah. Well, you knew it was as soon as he lit the cigarette because he didn't have a lighter. See, this movie's smart, Chad. I kind of think it was an alternate ending to this film, and those responsible for making this movie just couldn't decide how to end it. So they put them both in there. Right. It was the Nightmare on Elm Street conclusion of like, we got three fucking endings to this movie. How about all of them? It's like Clue. Yeah. One plus one plus one plus one. Then uh, Charlie Sheen comes to in the car. He's like, oh, fuck, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> So <laughs> seems like a real dangerous path to go down. Not, not going to hide my hand behind my back like a gun this time. He gets out of the car and everybody just swarms him, throws him against the side of the car. They're throwing the cuffs on him. And Dalton Voss comes over to check on his daughter. And he's like, so are you reasonably safe? Can I go back to the cameras now? And she's like, dad, he didn't do it. All right he's innocent we should help him and he's like that seems like a lot of trouble i'm just gonna go over here instead i'm gonna tell them how i saved you single-handedly that i wrestled him to the ground and i ate his gun believe me charlie sheen he's a loser and he's a moron in fact you know what i'm gonna call him has been sheen because that's what you are a has been that's what i keep hearing from people that's what they tell me that's what i'm hearing and then voss goes over and punches charlie sheen in the face it's the most incredible punch in the history of punches. It's the most powerful punch anyone has ever punched anyone ever. And the producer uh, that has been in the back of the Rollins's car the whole time is asking the cameraman, like, oh, did you get that punch? And Christy Swanson looks over at the producer and is like, say, I think I've got a stupid plan. Mm hmm. Rollins is really giving the business to Charlie Sheen here as he's reading the rights and like, do you know what they do to people like you in prison after lights out? Hey, girlfriend. Hey, girlfriend. That's a real line from this movie. Not in the script, I feel. Probably not. In fact, uh, I think I read somewhere that most of the Rollins and Mostel dialogue was improvised, which is not it, a stunt. That completely lines up. And so we hear a gunshot and everybody's like, huh? And whips around and it's Christy Swanson who now has a gun to the producer's head. And he's like, make sure you get a shot of this to the cameraman. And Dalton Voss is immediately like, wait a second. What are you doing? This is not good for me. This is not good for anyone. Put the gun down. Let Charlie Sheen go or I'm going to kill everyone on live TV. And so they just do. They're just like, okay, the solution to this problem seems to be just letting the two of them go with this this uh, television producer. She shoots a single gunshot at a helicopter that explodes. Yes. And she looks surprised by the explosion, but also empowered by it. <laughs> Where She's like, yeah, that's right. I will shoot the fuck out of a helicopter. And... Then when he goes to her, Charlie Sheen is like, hey, how are we going to get out of this one, sister? Don't worry. I've got a plan. And so her plan is to go to this traffic guy that we've seen the entire movie. She marches right up to him. And the whole time he's like, wow, they're coming right at me. It looks like they've got a gun and anger in their eyes. <laughs> and they're like, get out of the chopper. And they hijack. Th yeah, they basically tell the pilot to stay where he is. They hijack this helicopter and off they go. Yeah, the gin blossoms start playing or somebody who sounds like the gin blossom. Yeah. And we just cut to some South American beach where they're listening to a mariachi band and sipping drinks. And Charlie Sheen has a hilarious mustache. Yes. And it's not as good as the full handlebar that we saw in the mugshot, but it's it's no. getting there. And that's it. And the end. And then, you know, Rollins band plays us out, except for the tag on the movie, that little outtake with Charlie Sheen dressed as a clown doing the napalm line from uh, Apocalypse Now. This movie was terrible, Bo. <laughs> It is so bizarre. It's such a weird 
like product of its time i i really kind of love it i know you do so as we always do at the end of a season i would like for you to rank from best to worst or worst to best gentleman's choice how would you rank the six movies of season 10 hot wheels take it away Bo. all right so i never prepare for this adequately but let's i know you don't do you remember the movies yes let, yes i let's start at the bottom <laughs> Herbie Fully Loaded is the worst. Okay. Uh, above that, Gone in 60 Seconds. Then probably Tokyo Drift. Then Days of Thunder, uh, Chase, Days of Thunder, Cannonball Run. You and I could not be more different. My worst <laughs> yeah. is The Chase. I will never watch this movie again. And let me also say, I watched this movie on YouTube at a higher frame rate than it was meant to be shown because I couldn't download it, purchase it, or stream it anywhere. <laughs> no, it's gone underground, Chad. You oh got to be God. on the dark web to get yourself a copy of The Chase. The one I got was a, a French copy of the DVD. The Chase is my bottom. Above that, Herbie Fully Loaded. Above that, Tokyo Drift. The Cannonball Run, Gone in 60 Seconds, at the top is Days of Thunder. Uh, and I put those in order of what would I genuinely watch again. Oh, I would never watch Gone in 60 Seconds or Herbie Fully Loaded again. Weirdly, this season has movies I would return to. I would go back and watch Days of Thunder for Robert Duvall. I would go back and watch Tokyo yes. Drift because it's ridiculous. I would not. I would watch The Cannonball Run again. <laughs> I probably will, yes, but... <laughs> and so, and I will at some point watch The Chase again because I'm a dirtbag. The best movie we watched this whole season isn't even on the list. The best movie we watched this whole season was the original Gone in 60 Seconds. I would agree with that. That's the best thing that we saw. Yeah, so. it was certainly the most entertaining on a kind of jaw-dropping what-the-fuck level. But let's talk about season 11. Oh, Chad. Holy shit. Talk about your timely seasons. Well, let me just say that season 11, we're calling a bit of an audible because season 11 was supposed to be Bond's James Bond's. Mm -hmm. But because the most recent James Bond movie has been pushed out to November of this year, we're doing the same. Why would it ever be pushed, Chad? That seems like a blockbuster movie. This seems like the perfect time to release a blockbuster movie. The coronavirus. What the fuck is that? Go open the internet. All right. Oh my God. And because the coronavirus is causing disruption across the entire globe, we are bringing you season 11. We're all going to die, which is going to feature six motion pictures where the fate of humanity lays in the balance. And kicking this off is going to be none other than the action packed motion picture outbreak starring everyone's <laughs> heroic leading man, Dustin Hoffman. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely gonna gonna do some stunts. Definitely doing some stunts. <laughs> Having recently watched this, Chad, I can tell you from a uh, very <laughs> recent experience, this movie is terrible. I know. It's funny. We have so many seasons backlog that we can do. And we were so excited about James Bond. The new James Bond movie's coming out. That gets kicked. And we just pulled this one up from the bullpen and said, we're all going to die. You're season 11. And you're all going to die season said, put me in coach. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. By the way, we're all going to die. And so we, we figured it was fitting just in case we do in fact all die. Right. We will be here with you holding your hand, much like the toys in Toy Story 3 that all knew they were going to die. We will be here to help ease you into the pain of your ultimate demise. You're welcome. Is it weird that I made an edit of Toy Story 3 that ends there? For you? No, not at all. <laughs> so come back in two weeks' time. As always, like, rate, review. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, you can reach us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. You can find us on social media. This is the end of Season 10. Bo, any final thoughts on Hot Wheels? Six movies featuring high-speed car chase, thrills and actions on four wheels, maybe six or possibly 18, depending upon which movie we were talking about. I feel like I accidentally learned some things about cars, which makes me a better person i feel good for you and I, I think all of our listeners are better people for having listened to this season they always are come back and see us in two weeks and we will continue to make you a better person not really warning will not make you a better